This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is justice. I'm speaking with political philosopher George Klosko from the University of Virginia, and the conversation will begin in a moment. George Klosko from the University of Virginia is my guest. We will be talking about justice, uh, usually from uh, what we call a social, uh, political, uh, theoretical angle. Uh, just so people know, I had actually done a, an interview with George almost a month ago, but it was lost due to an electrical outage that happened in my uh, own neighborhood. So this is a second retake. So uh, mistakes do happen on the internet and on YouTube. But George, uh, thank you for doing the interview again. If you could give a little background about uh, who you are uh, and your takes on justice, anything you've written, etc. cetera. Sure, it's my pleasure. Thanks for coming back and interviewing me again. So I'm a political theorist. I was trained in the history of political thought at Columbia. I did my early work on Plato. I moved to the University of Virginia in 1983, so 35 years ago. And since I've been at the University of Virginia, my focus has changed to contemporary political philosophy. I work mainly on political application from what we call a Rawlsian standpoint. So recent books, I wrote a critical history of the welfare state a couple of years ago, and my most recent book is on political obligation. It's called Why We Should Obey the Law, and I believe that we should obey the law. And I try to make that argument, which turns out to be more difficult than most people would realize intuitively. Well, let us take uh, the jumping off point uh, from the law. Uh, in our first conversation, you had delineated the differences between uh, English common law and what most of Europe uh, uses, which you said uh, goes back to Rome. Uh, could you uh, delineate the differences in the approach to justice uh, and uh, between those two? Well, I'm not sure there's necessarily a difference um, in the way they see justice. There's a big difference in the way they see the law. So the Renaissance, Renaissance is literally rebirth. It's the rebirth of classical learning. And what happened is that all of the European countries, and I think it's all of the European countries aside from Britain, adopted Roman law, a revamped Roman law as the basis of their legal systems. In England and the U.S., we have something different. We have common law, which is um, um, law made by judges, basically, case by case. Um, stare decisis, you want um, decisions to set precedents, these precedents to stand. In the United States, the one state that still practices something like the continental system of Roman law is um, Louisiana, which has French Napoleonic law as its basis. So these are just different ways of viewing the legal system. I'm not sure if the content of what is justice in the two systems is necessarily um, different, but the way they view the legal system is, of course, different. The last time we spoke, you'd mentioned uh, the mention in Streetcar Named Desire, the play about Napoleonic Code and Stanley referencing it uh, in there. Uh, is that because uh, one uh, places the a presumption of innocence, for example, on uh, an accused, say, in common law, and that isn't in, say, Roman law? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know. I know that in um, different legal systems, they work prosecution differently. In the inquisitorial system, um, I think the judges try to find out the truth, as opposed to the American system, which you've got a defense lawyer and you've got a prosecutor, and they argue it out. I don't know if there is a direct connection between Roman law and the inquisitorial system or the English system and the adversarial system. Um, model of conducting trials. It might be. Um, in England, going back to the Magna Carta, you have the idea that people's rights should be protected. Greater emphasis on individual rights than you have in many continental countries. So it might go back to that. But in France, of course, you have the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. So one of the great documents asserting human rights came out of the French Revolution in France. So um, I think these are just different um, aspects of the practice of justice. And again, how they fit together um, is really um, complicated. And um, I'm not sure exactly how the different pieces uh, fit together in each uh, country that we could talk about. You stated just now that uh, uh, the adversarial system, well, the adversarial system 
tries to get to a sense of justice by having uh, one side try to prove the other side is wrong, whereas uh, you just stated that in sort of Roman law, more a more direct path towards what is considered yeah. the truth is taken. Uh, do you think, how did the adversarial system that we use arise and does it, uh, does it detract from the search for justice? Yeah, I don't know. You know, again, it's a good question. It's a question you'd have to ask an historian of law. Um, what I do know is liberalism. So our political philosophy is liberalism. It's liberalism with a small L, not liberal with a capital L, like Teddy Kennedy or Walter Mondale, the left wing of the Democratic um, Party. But liberalism as political philosophy focusing on the individual arose in England and France, and it arose out of revolutionary conflict. So it's in revolutionary conflict that we got the works of John Locke, our Declaration of Independence, and again, I just mentioned the French Revolution. So there's a connection between liberalism and forcible protection of rights. And it makes sense to think that our adversarial system in which you have a forcible advocate protecting your rights um, arose in conjunction with these other developments. But again, um, history is complicated, and I'm not sure about this. But I think there is a connection between the adversarial system and the English tradition of the independent judiciary, the judiciary um, being independent of the crown, um, representing a check on the power of the crown. This makes sense, but the fact that it makes sense uh, does not mean that it's the way it actually happened. Um, when we first spoke, uh, we had uh, gone off a little bit talking about the association of rights, human rights, civil rights, with property here in America. That, uh, for example, when the first elections were held, it was landed white males, meaning people who owned property. Um, can you go, go into a little bit of uh, the connection between property rights here in America and civil rights? Yeah, no, it's, it's um, actually a fascinating subject. So in the liberal tradition, which emphasizes the individual and protection of individual rights, one of the most important rights that has to be protected is property rights. So Locke, who's one of the most important thinkers in the liberal tradition, and his great work, A Second Treatise of Civil Government, in Chapter 5, he talks about property rights. And this is the most influential discussion of property in our entire tradition, and in America in particular, um, less so in European countries, in America there's very close association of property rights and other rights, and we tend to see other rights, conceptualize its property rights. It's really distinct from the United States. The United States has never had socialism, it's never had a serious socialist um, party, it's never really had a serious workers party. In America, the welfare state is based on property rights, and this separates it from other um, countries. So the most important welfare programs, social welfare programs in the United States, Social Security, it's property rights that you are taxed, you pay a certain percentage of your income every year until you retire. When you retire, you get the money back. It is your property. And when we um, started Medicare in 1965, Medicare is part of the Social Security system, and even though there are a lot of flaws in conceiving rights to health care as property rights, and I can go into these if you're interested, but even though there are difficulties with this sort of understanding, again, Medicare is part of the Social Security system. You pay a certain percentage of your salary to Medicare. It's collected in the trust fund. So the only way these programs could be passed in the United States was if they were viewed as property, as opposed to what you have in England, the national health system, which takes care of everybody based on the idea that everybody is a member of the community. This sort of language, this sort of understanding is really alien to the United States. You know, um, you just said um, in the United States, you've got this peculiar association of rights and property rights. So it probably is um, distinctive from all other countries, from all other countries I know of, and perhaps from all other countries in the world. I want to pick up, uh, George, on what you mentioned about uh, health rights, but before I do that, I do want to talk about something that has come up 
in the couple of hundred years since the landed uh, white male. And that's the idea of intellectual property rights and how that conforms to justice. Because in the last decade or last century or so, we've uh, you know had the rise of copyrights. Well, we did, we've always had copyrights and trademarks and, and, and whatnot. But uh, the idea of intellectual property rights, especially in Silicon Valley in the last 20, 30 years has taken off. Um, is there a connection, do you think, with the modern conception of intellectual property rights and the idea of, uh, of justice uh, as there was with, say, actual physical land? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And again, I mentioned Locke. So what's distinctive of Locke's argument, and again, it's chapter five of this second treatise, what's distinctive of Locke's argument is that you acquire property rights by mixing your labor with something. So it's commonsensical if there's a blueberry bush and it's just out in the wild, it doesn't belong to anyone. You pick the blueberries, the blueberries belong to you. If you catch a fish in the ocean, you know, again, it's different if you catch a fish in your neighbor's backyard from his koi pond. But if you catch a fish in the ocean, the fish belongs to you because you caught it, you mixed your labor with it. So I think that the basic idea of intellectual property is that if you create something, it belongs to you. If you mix your labor with it, it belongs to you. If you write interesting software code, if you invent something, which is the basis of our patent system, um, it belongs to you. And then you get into really difficult questions uh, concerning how much control you should have over it, how long your control should last, um, if it's something that is important for the health and welfare of other people, um, like drugs, yeah. should you be able to control this forever, or do other people have rights also? So Locke recognizes that even though um, something belongs to you, there are limitations upon your ability to appropriate property as it affects the well-being of other people. And so I think you have the same thing in regard to intellectual property, but working out the details uh, is extremely difficult. But intellectual property, I think, is an extension of the way we understand property in other areas. Well, that segues back into health, because oftentimes now, uh, quote unquote, big pharma will come up with a drug and they'll have maybe, I don't know, three, five, eight years, whatever that, uh, uh, I guess it's, is it the FDA approves it? And then a generic form of the drug for one tenth or one twentieth the price can come on market so that it gives a certain amount of time for the drug company to recoup its R&D and make a little bit of a profit, although they make a huge profit generally. Um, so when you were talking earlier about uh, healthcare as a right, uh, does that naturally conflict with the intellectual property rights of a company? Yeah, no, absolutely. But it's a really difficult question. And we had scandals. I, I don't remember the details. The epinephrine pen, yeah. um, somebody acquired the rights to this and raised the price 500% or 1,000%. He's in and jail now. <laughs> drugs. So they, they, there's a real difficulty here if it's property rights. You know, if it's property rights, um, the drug company should be able to do whatever it wants with its property. Um, unfortunately, it's an exceptional kind of property in that it, it has effects in regard to the health and well-being of other people. Yeah. So if you make a drug prohibitively expensive, people who can't afford the drug are going to die. Yeah. So it's an exceptional case, and it's especially difficult in the United States because the United States treats um, drugs um, more as personal property, property of the corporations that own them than other um, countries. So again, if I need a drug that costs you know, $500,000 a year, um, do I have a right to it? If I have a right to it, it means that the government or the community or other people are going to have to put up the $500,000 a year to give me the drug. And in a country like England, they ration healthcare to a certain extent. But the understanding of the community in England is that everybody is a member of the community. We should take care of everybody, which is one way you understand things like drugs, um, a particular form of intellectual property. Whereas in the United States, if my right to healthcare is property rights, um, my right to healthcare depends upon only as much as I'm able to pay. 
And chances are I have not paid enough to be able to afford a $500,000 a year drug. So there's a real conflict between the way we conceptualize our rights to health care and the realities of what people need in order to survive. And we're beginning to see this uh, coming apart as um, candidates are running, really for the first time since Harry Truman, candidates are running talking about a right to health care. That's a right to health care, which means that health care has to be supplied for all Americans by the community. So it stops being property rights. It becomes something like a human right, yeah. something that everybody is entitled to simply by virtue of the fact that they're human beings. So we are beginning to see a um, real conflict in American public culture. And the way it's beginning to work, it looks like uh, this idea that everybody is entitled to health care is going to win out um, within the next 20 years, the next 50 years, um, who knows. But uh, what this means is basically the end of the insurance model of providing health care and something like Medicare for all, you know, a system of government provided health care for everybody. Um, basically what you have in all of the other developed countries. You've got different forms of this. Some are based on insurance companies, some like England, the national health. Um, but in each of these countries, uh, people are guaranteed health care as a right, which distinguishes them from the United States. Just as a side note, I was reading an article uh, in the last week uh, about, about a lot of health, uh, a lot of insurance companies across the board think that uh, insurance as we know it will be gone in the second half of this century, not only because of health insurance issues, but just insuring your home with the rising global warming and freak storms that government is going to have to be the backer of, you know, homes that are built on floodplains or whatnot. But that's a totally different area. Um, it's the, you know, it's the same idea. It's the yeah. idea that you know, the community takes care of the members of the community yeah. as opposed to if you've got health insurance, you get health care. If you've got fire insurance, you get um, your home rebuilt after a fire. Yeah. You know, they're just different ways of understanding um, the relationship between the individual and the community. And yeah. America is distinctively individualistic. You mentioned the uh, independent white man property owner. This is the governing idea in the United States, but that idea is running up against the reality of living in the 21st century. Yeah. Uh, concomitant to the idea, and I want to get back to tying this to justice, uh, of intellectual property rights, or property rights uh, health and health rights, are two terms come to mind, eminent domain and public domain. The public domain being that after X amount of years, a certain amount of time, uh, intellectual property uh, ceases to be owned by one person, usually after death in terms of copyright and a certain amount of time. Uh, in terms of works that are made by corporations or works for hire after 50 or 70 years, whatever it might be. And then there's eminent domain, which would state that if uh, your home is standing in the way of public progress or whatnot, the government can give you a fair price for the home, seize it, and do what it wants with it. Can you talk to me about those two terms in terms of uh, personal or, or uh, social justice, eminent domain and public domain? Well, you know, it's similar to what we've been talking about. So again, going back to Locke, we recognize personal property, but there are also claims of the community against your property. And Locke basically says you can accumulate if you leave enough and it's good for other people. But if you recognize the rights of other people, so if I own a home and the government wants to build a highway and my home is in the way, you know, as you just said, the government should give me fair compensation for my home so that the highway can be built, which is beneficial to the community. So the idea is commonsensical. The idea is almost irresistible, that if the community needs something that an individual has, the individual is fairly compensated, and the welfare of the community wins out over the welfare, or wins out over the preferences of the individual. So this is perfectly commonsensical. It's become controversial because communities have been abusing this. So communities have been compass, well, they've been seizing people's property um, on false pretexts. So um, one argument would be that we want to build a shopping mall or we want to build more expensive stores on this street. So your rights as a property owner have to give way to the community's desire for higher tax base. 
So something like that. Many people would think that this is not a justified taking of property, whereas eminent domain um, is based on the assumption that when the community takes somebody's property, um, it does it for a good reason. So if the community is not doing it for a good reason, it's an abuse of power, like any other um, abuse of power in government. And as the government's gotten bigger, and um, something like eminent domain has been used more often, we get more complaints about it, it becomes more controversial, and it becomes a Democrat versus Republican issue, as traditionally Republicans put more weight on property rights. So um, you know, eminent domain opens itself up to the same sort of clashes between the individual and the community that you find in other areas of social justice. Uh, and just to pick up on that, a lot of times, too, eminent domain uh, goes back to a lot of the broken treaties between the U.S. government and Native American groups. For example, you would have, uh, well, we cede this land to your reservation, but then all of a sudden gold or some other valuable uh, mineral or something is found there, and then the government tries to rescind that, that treaty, which would be you know, uh, similar to uh, instead of seizing your home to build a highway, uh, we had a surveyor that found that you were sitting on top of you know, 100 billion barrels of oil, and we want to seize that land for the... the... I mean, this is just abuse of power. Um, in the, the case I remember in New York, Governor Carey, he was a governor during the 1970s, he had a beach house, and another house was standing, uh, was interfering with his view of the beach. So he had that house seized and condemned so he could have a better view of the beach. So something like this is just a clear um, abuse of power. And um, I think it's widely viewed now that in our dealing with Native Americans, with Indians, you know, there's wholesale abuse of power. And you hear words like genocide um, tossed around. What's interesting is that when the Cherokees and the other so-called civilized tribes were chased out of Georgia, in the 1820s and sent to Oklahoma on the so-called Trail of Tears, um, the Supreme Court found in favor of the Indians. The Indians sued and they went to court for their right not to be removed from their land just because um, farmers wanted their land. Um, but President Jackson ignored the Supreme Court decision. His famous utterance is, um, is Justice Marshall has made his decision. Let's see him enforce it. So again, it's just um, abuse of power. And one of the problems with government, the central problem of all of political theory is that power is easily abused. You know, I'm sure you've heard Lord Acton's dictum, dictum uh, power corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely. And again, the liberal tradition, our tradition of political theory comes out of the idea that political power can be abused and individuals not only have to have rights against the government, but individuals have to have means of enforcing their rights against the government. And for my money, uh, liberal political theory was born in 1531 when Luther, who was the most important theologian in Germany at the time, argued that the German princes could resist the Catholic emperor who was trying to convert them back to Catholicism. So it's the idea of resisting unjust political authority that is central to the origin of liberalism. So you wanted to mention the Magna Carta, which we had mentioned in our first discussion. You know, we, in, in our tradition, the English, Anglo-American tradition, the English tradition, we often talk about the importance of the Magna Carta. And what was distinctive of the Magna Carta, if memory serves, is Article 61. And Article 61 of the Magna Carta not only asserts that the barons have rights against the king, but it asserts that if the king abuses the rights of the barons, the barons can organize and make war against the king. So it's not the idea that individuals have rights. In this case, we're talking about the barons having rights. It's that these rights can be enforced, and they can be enforced through the use of force. And that's what's distinctive of the Magna Carta. That's what's distinctive of Luther in 1531. And that's what's distinctive of Locke and the Declaration of Independence and the origin of the liberal tradition in general. Um, I wanted to pick up on something we also talked about uh, in our first discussion, and you had mentioned about uh, the jury system, and you had talked about in ancient Rome, or maybe it was Greece, 
uh, that juries could consist of hundreds or thousands of people, in fact. Uh, can you uh, recap that idea, how we uh, got down from thousands to uh, a dozen people, usually? Well, it's not practical, but in Athens, in ancient Athens, and perhaps other great democracies, we don't know as much about other great democracies as we know about Athens, juries could be up to 2,000 people. So Athens was the most democratic political system that's ever existed. It's democratic for citizens, and citizens were always uh, males, free males, um, didn't include slaves, and a large percentage of the population was slaves. But um, through a lottery system, anybody who wanted to serve on a jury could serve on the jury and um, could apply to serve on the jury, and a certain number would be um, picked and then Pericles, the great Athenian leader, instituted the practice of paying people to serve on juries. And it's important to pay people to serve on juries because if you don't pay them, they have to give up a day's pay and only people with means will be able to participate. So we had a system in which juries were large, up to 2,000 people. The jury that, that convicted Socrates was 501 people. But this isn't really um, practical for many political bodies. And again, more important, um, as we moved beyond the ancient world, the idea of these participatory democracies really went away. So the idea that everybody has to be able to participate on um, the jury, and the jury would be chosen by law, didn't have any resonance in the medieval world and the modern world. So what we had was the idea, what was instituted was the idea that the jury represents a check upon the king's justice, that you were tried by a jury of your peers. You can't be punished unless a jury of your peers agrees that you should be punished. So again, the idea there is checking the abuse of power by the king. The conceptualization is different than the idea that we as citizens should be able to judge um, cases ourselves. What's more important, again, is the idea that the um, royal authority can be abused, and we as citizens should have the ability to check royal authority. So the basis, the intellectual basis of the political systems changed between ancient Greece and um, the medieval world and early modern England. Um, you talk about the jury of the peers, but oftentimes uh, in modern here yeah, America or, or the West, uh, there's a certain apathy people have towards uh, the justice system as a whole. Uh, originally as conceived in uh, Athens or uh, ancient Greece, uh, were people, were, were there any kind of like tests they had to take? You know, we've had here, for example, tests to be able to vote. Uh, were, I mean, could anyone, if they, you said it was like uh, males, but did you have to at least be, uh, say, uh, literate? Yeah, it was, it was actually serious in that you had to be male at the age of 17 or 18, I forget. Um, you had to apply to become a citizen, and you underwent an examination. And I don't remember the details of the examination, but the examination is basically by the leading people in your community. You're examined, and if you fail, so this is really serious, if you fail this examination, you not only don't become a citizen, you become a slave. So um, the Greeks took citizenship very seriously. Citizenship was a tribal, really, tribal relationship. You could only become a citizen by being the child of citizens. Mm -hmm. So um, none of this um, birthright citizen stuff. So again, citizenship was the centerpiece of people's lives. Um, according to Aristotle, the highest virtue of the ordinary person is to rule and be ruled in turn, to take part in politics. So politics should be the center of somebody's life. But again, this is possible only in small participatory states. So this is small only in the Greek polis. In the Greek polis, um, population would generally be below 100,000 um, in our terms. So once we move to larger territorial units, the Roman Empire and then modern nation states, you know, the U.S. is 330 million people. You know, so the idea that everybody is able to participate doesn't make any sense. So the entire, again, conceptualization of the relationship between individuals and community is different. And this is the greatest break in the history of political theory when you moved away from the participatory idea of the policy 
to the idea that the individual is a citizen of a large territorial unit and freedom is being left alone by the authorities in that territorial unit. And again, liberalism is that you are able to protect your freedom uh, through force if it's being abused. But the idea of freedom as being left alone by the government is, is again, what's really distinctive of our idea of um, the relationship between the individual and the community. And the jury comes in here as another means to protect the freedom of the individual. So if you're accused of a crime, the government can't simply lock you up. The government can only lock you up and quote a jury of your peers agrees that you've committed the crime and should be locked up. Uh, justice and freedom are often intertwined. Going back in American history, though, there were slaves who sued for their freedom. Uh, uh, infamously, uh, slaves were said to be, I think, three-fifths of a person at one point in this country. Uh, could Is justice possible for someone who is not considered a full person or not considered free? You know, I mean, that seems silly to even ask, but uh, could, let's say, a slave that was accused of murder be found innocent? Is there any way that could be a just, you know, that well, could... Well, being found innocent, but the whole idea that they're slaves, you know, just goes against uh, all of our basic ideas. So Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Jefferson was, of course, a slave owner. So this is a terrible paradox at the heart of um, old liberalism. But again, these ideas are really important ideas because if you take the idea seriously, the slaves have to be freed. If you take the idea seriously, women have to get the right to vote because women are equal. If you take the idea seriously, same-sex couples should be allowed to marry. You know, they should have the same rights as everybody else. So if you take this idea of equality seriously, and equality is the basic idea in our conception of justice, if you take it seriously, you know, much of what went on in the old world um, is just, you know, it's just um, unacceptable. And um, the most basic ideas in contemporary liberal political theory as opposed to older liberal political theory are the ideas that people are equal and people should be treated with equal concern and respect. So this is something that, again, um, um, is evolving. But this is really incompatible with much of what went on um, uh, in past centuries. I want to tie back the idea of, uh, well, talking about uh, three-fifths personhood, going back to property rights. Uh, I think we had mentioned it in our first discussion about corporate personhood. And I think it was in 1819 or 1820 that corporate personhood was granted here in the U.S. Um, I want to ask about uh, the idea of justice in a justice system where you have basically a corporation, uh, a group of individuals becoming basically a fictive entity that's granted personhood versus, say, an individual. Uh, if they are in some kind of legal tussle, of course, a, a corporation is going to have far more uh, material advantage, uh, uh, lawyers and uh, ability to hire people to investigate things. Um, what Do you know what the, the basic uh, premise behind corporate personhood was and uh, how it stands in the justice system today? Yeah, no, it's a big subject. It's not something um, I know about. I know the idea is that granting people certain privileges if they get together and form a corporation has beneficial public effects. Mm -hmm. So this is the, um, the argument. And then again, you're going to get into a lot of squabbling about exactly where you should draw the lines, what sort of things should a corporation be able to do, what sort of things should a corporation not be able to do. And again, the test is, um, is what is in the public interest. And you'll get a lot of disagreement about what is in the public interest. But the idea of corporation and the idea of legal personhood goes all the way back to the Roman Empire. And it's a hugely important idea in the development of, um, of our political theory. So um, it's got a long history. But um, the niceties of corporate law, the details of co corporate law, depend upon different people's understanding of what's in the public interest today.
you know, so Citizens United, the argument for Citizens United is that encouraging more speech is good for the polity, that you get more political debate, which helps to educate people. And a lot of people would disagree with that, that the consequences have actually not been beneficial, even though they were supposed to be beneficial. So again, you're going to get arguments about what the consequences of various um, conditions attached to corporations are, and um, whether these consequences are going to be good for the community or bad for the community. I want to get back, George, to talking about, uh, you'd mentioned the Trail of Tears, and uh, uh, in our first conversation we had talked about uh, race uh, and ethnicity, etc., uh, and the justice system uh, uh, here in the U.S. Um, to what degree do you think that uh, uh, race and, and ethnicity and even sex, and you mentioned as, as sexual identity, I guess now, uh, have played a part uh, within the idea of justice for people here, at least in America? Yeah, I mean, it's really, uh, it's at the absolute centerpiece of theoretical debate about justice. So I'm a sort of standard liberal, and I believe in equality, and I believe that people should be treated equally, regardless of their race, regardless of their gender, regardless of their sexual identity, that it's wrong to discriminate against people for these reasons. And then you get other arguments that this isn't enough, that simply treating people as equals isn't enough if people have had a long history of discrimination. So this is the argument for affirmative action, that African Americans have been discriminated against, they've got vastly less um, wealth than white Americans, that um, they've suffered from the brutalizing effects of slavery and the after effects of slavery. And as Lyndon, excuse me, as Lyndon Johnson said in one of his famous speeches, simply to take people up to the starting line and say, now you're equal and have to compete equally is unfair because they're not going to be able to compete equally. So again, these are really, really difficult questions. Uh, to what extent are you justified in treating people unequally for the sake of bringing about greater equality in the future? And this is the argument about affirmative action. And then you get arguments about um, whether more than justice is required in order to treat people um, equally, um, are they entitled to recognition? Is recognition by the state in addition to the absence of um, discrimination, is recognition by the state necessary? And again, these are really um, um, important, difficult issues. People with different political um, beliefs are going to disagree about them, but these are at the absolute forefront of contemporary understandings of justice and um, as they are at the forefront of arguments about public policy. Yeah. Uh, so people are beginning to demand their rights, other people are beginning to um, resent this. And we've of course seen this with African Americans throughout the entire history of the United States. And you see it most clearly now um, with attempts to prevent African Americans and other minorities, but mainly African Americans from voting. Yeah. You see this in many southern states. And uh, even even in some other states, Arizona, out west, and a few others. Um, uh, let me just uh, when we first spoke, I had asked a little bit about hunter gatherer tribes and the the almost necessary egalitarianism of these small groups. Just as you said, uh, in ancient Athens, you had smaller groups; you could have more uh, uh, vox populi uh, in a sense. Uh, whereas now with uh, hundreds of millions of people in our country, I think we're the fourth largest country population-wise, maybe even third behind China and India. Um, and you'd also mentioned earlier about how a lot of European democracies have this idea, idea that taking care of everyone is social justice. Is it now in a, a, a large country like ours where we necessarily have specialists, in a sense, uh, do not some some people, I guess, would argue that if you're a, a scientist, if you're a researcher into medicine, if you're this, that, or the other thing that has a higher uh, value in some way than, say, just being a car mechanic or a factory line worker, uh, some people would argue that they do by just the virtue of 
what they do, uh, they would have a, a greater sense of place or, or priority within society. This is why they uh, doctors are paid more than car mechanics. Um, does that hold any water within the sense of person-to-person -person justice within a society? Well, you know, again, it's a big subject. You get uh, disagreements. Rawls, John Rawls, is the most important um, contemporary liberal political philosopher. Is probably the most important political philosopher of the last hundred years. And Rawls uh, would argue that you can only treat people, you can only give people more, uh, a larger share of income, if it is beneficial to, to the poorest members of society. So society should be designed to take care of the poorest members. So a surgeon, you know, who might make $600,000 a year or $700,000 a year in the United States, he could not make more than the average amount of money unless paying him more is beneficial to society as a whole. Paying him more is beneficial to the poorest members of society. And again, there's an argument here. It takes many years of intensive training to become a surgeon. If people were only going to be paid as much as, um, you know, shop assistants, um, if they were surgeons, they're not going to undergo all of this training in order to become surgeons. So you clearly have to compensate people for the hardships that they undergo in order to gain specialized knowledge. But does this entitle them to more? And you get really difficult questions. Um, what did I read that um, Steph Curry, when LeBron James must make, I think it's probably worth it, makes $40 million a year. Can you pay an athlete $40 million a year? And on Rawlsian grounds, you can't pay him that much unless it's beneficial to society. Somebody like LeBron, who's a great basketball player, would probably be a great basketball player and win championships for a million dollars a year instead of $40 million a year or half a million dollars a year. So you get into these sorts of um, questions. We, of course, have a market in the United States. Basically, in the United States, you're paid what other people are willing to pay you. Yeah. Well, and people would say, well, LeBron James might make $40 million a year, but what does the owner of his new team, the Lakers, make? You know, and how much does that person uh, contribute to society? You know, probably a lot, lot less than LeBron. Right, and then you get the argument, should the owner of the Lakers be entitled to the enormous amount of money that he makes? Yeah. So, you know, um, I think Jeff Bezos is now the richest yeah. person in the world, not Bill Gates. Yeah. And Bill Gates is something like $80 billion. You know, should any human being have $80 billion? Yeah. It was the argument. Bill Gates uses it to do a lot of good, but... Um, is a is it a fair system in which somebody has so much money when so many people uh, don't have anything? Well, and, and also these are questions of social yeah. justice. And also with Gates, I know many computer programmers. Famously, Gates supposedly stole his initial code from some other poor schlub who's now almost yeah. forgotten to history. So you know, um, let me uh, talk about uh, social media. We. Uh, touch a little bit about that in our first discussion. Um, here in the last 15, 20 years, basically the, the, this new century, uh, the rise of social media uh, has sort of democratized, in a sense, uh, the discussions that people have online about politics, philosophy, sex, sports, whatever it might be. Uh, but necessarily, I don't necessarily think that's necessarily a good thing. A lot of people say, yeah, people have the right to talk. But not everyone should be listened to because, you know, I think the idea, people, the wisdom of the common man, well, you just have to look on Twitter and that's dead. You know, people don't use that phrase anymore. Yeah, you know, it's a great um, subject. So, Mill, you know, the most eloquent defense of freedom of thought and freedom of discussion in our tradition is John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. And Mill's basically a utilitarian. And Mill argues that freedom of thought and discussion is going to be beneficial because it's going to educate people and the truth is going to come out. So we do better um, even allowing wrong ideas to be propagated than suppressing them because in dealing with wrong ideas, we come to appreciate the truth much better. And I think the Internet, as you just said, has shown that this is wrong that the results of unfettered discussion are not to make people smarter, it's to make people stupider. Mm -hmm. That um, they huddle in groups of like-minded people, 
They don't seek out ideas that um, disagree with them. People who are haters or racists or people who have other objectionable ideas are able to use the internet not to challenge their ideas and learn something, but to find other people who have similar ideas, which allows them to reinforce their ideas and to become even worse. You know, so unfortunately, um, the great liberal or one of the great liberal defenses of freedom of thought and discussion is probably wrong. And the internet, um, again, shows that it's wrong. And I think there's a compelling case for, um, for um, monitoring the internet, um, controlling it, except the difficulty here is in all of liberal political theory is the possibility of abuse by government. So the question is, who will watch the watchers? Right. So that's a real uh, problem, but something has to be done to, take, to keep the fake news out of the Internet, to keep the fake news that's put there by foreign governments. You know, because, again, people don't believe this. And, again, the Internet is not making them smarter or better informed. It's making them stupid and making them believe in conspiracy theories. You know, so it's a real um, problem. I've, hear, I've heard respected political commentators saying the internet is the worst thing that has ever happened to American democracy. I'm not sure if that's um, true, but the internet does pose some real problems for American democracy, as we saw in the last presidential election. Well, even with things like uh, the taking away of net neutrality, uh, this is going to, uh, I mean, putting aside the stu general stupidity of people arguing endlessly on Twitter or, or blogs or whatnot, uh, we're, we're having the rationing of what sites can be seen by whom and at what speed and and and, and how much they have to pay for, uh, et cetera. Yeah, it's going to make corporations give corporations even more control. Yeah, I don't um, necessarily believe that corporations are um, beneficent; that they have the interests of the American public at heart. They have their own interests at heart, and in general, um, I think they have to be regulated to make sure that they promote the public good rather than their own good. But then again, you get to the problem of how do you make sure that government does this properly. And corporations often say, well, I have a fiduciary responsibility to my investors or whatnot. But what happens to the social responsibility to follow laws, the civic responsibility? Uh, I had mentioned two terms when we first spoke about the social contract and the commonweal. And corporations seem to ignore this uh, for their own benefit. And just global warming is a perfect example of this, you know, with uh, oil, big oil. You know, absolutely. So corporations are legal fictions. Um, the details of what corporations are, what they're able to do, what they're required to do are um, defined by law. And, you know, I agree with what you just said, that the law should be such that corporations have to promote the public good in addition to promoting their own good. And, and the so it should not be their only yeah. duty to raise the value of their stock so their stock um, holders can benefit. Yeah, and uh, the government has to, I mean, the government recently, for example, film lovers like my wife were heartbroken that uh, a website called Filmstruck was was canceled uh, or shut down by AT&T, even though it was making money because AT&T wants to have its own streaming service for its own movies to charge more. And yet there's a perfect example of acting against, uh, uh, here you have a property that's making money, but you're acting against the will of your, your own customers. The idea that corporations somehow are answerable to anyone other than themselves is ridiculous. But the government approved AT&T's takeover of Time Warner. What happened ever happened to justice being served by not having monopolies? Yeah, no, I mean, the difficulty is that in our system, especially with our system of campaign finance, um, government is often more responsive to the interests of wealthy people, uh, wealthy corporations, than it is to your average citizen. So again, it's a real problem. Um, disciplining government is um, one of the main problems that we confront. As you can see now, when the president is talking about ordering the, the Justice Department to prosecute specific private citizens, you know, this is an atrocious abuse of power. So how do you prevent it from happening? You know, again, it's a real problem. So the more things that you allow Congress to regulate, the more possible you make it for Congress to abuse this power to benefit uh, people other than the public at large.
about the only thing you could say uh, about Trump versus, say, Nixon is that he has no problem making his enemies list known public. <laughs> well, Nixon was a genuine traitor, yeah. you know, during the Vietnam War. So I don't know if Trump has risen to the position of being a genuine traitor, yeah. but probably not for want of trying. <laughs> uh, well, continuing on, uh, George, you had stated earlier that you'd uh, written uh, recently about the welfare state. Um, People often talk about uh, socialism and uh, tie it to communism, and uh, a lot of European democracies are uh, looked down with uh, a lot of dread and or suspicion here in the U.S. Um, what do you think that the moderns uh, say uh, social, uh, a democratic social state of Europe uh, versus the United States? Do you see one or the other being more of a just system or well, I think, you know, I'm sort of a Bernie Sanders uh, social democrat, and I think that a system that um, controls inequality more um, is more just, a system that guarantees everybody health care, guarantees everybody the right to education is a more just system. So I tend to think that the United States is less just in these ways than other countries, you know, especially uh, the Scandinavian countries. So the Scandinavian countries, you pay higher taxes, um, but you get more. And I think that people's um, lives are better. Um, poor people's lives are certainly better than they are in Scandinavia. Um, you look at um, you look at healthcare. The United States um, spends seventeen percent of its GDP on healthcare. And the numbers are much worse than they are in almost all, or maybe that's not true, in many other developed countries that life expectancy is lower, that infant mortality is lower. You know, so again, um, less money can be spent, but if it's distributed more fairly, society as a whole um, would benefit. But this really goes against uh, the most deep-seated currents of American political culture. America is distinctively individualist, but again, America has never had a socialist, a real socialist party. It's never had a real workers' party. The most successful socialist candidate for office was Debs, Eugene yeah. Debs. In 1912, he got 6% of the vote. So this is um, a question among social scientists, historians, why this is true. And the answer, which I find most convincing, is the diversity of the United States. So compared to a country like Denmark or Sweden, or even Britain, the United States is enormously diverse. It's diverse religiously, it's diverse racially, it's diverse in terms of people's um, ethnic origin, um, their national origin. And it's, it's just more difficult to get a cohesive community in the United States than it is um, in these other countries. This is something that makes the United States great in many ways. The American individualism, this sort of openness, I think is responsible for a lot of the great uh, features of America, the dynamic economy to a certain extent, and also uh, the dynamic science establishment, the fact that the U.S. is a disproportionate share of Nobel Prizes. Um, things like this, but it's also um, harmful in many other ways. So I think the United States needs a stronger sense of community, but it's difficult to know where the stronger sense of community is going to come from, especially now when there's this tremendous bifurcation between red states and blue states, between Democrats and Republicans, which is really um, something ominous and awful that's developed in the last 20, 30 years. Since you mentioned the Scandinavian states, uh, which would be Norway, uh, Denmark, Sweden, and some people would include Finland in that, uh, I was reading something just recently about uh, Norwegian prisons. And uh, here in the U.S., if you commit a felony and go to jail, you often have your franchise, your right to vote, taken away, certainly in prison. But even uh, it's difficult to get re-enfranchised once you're out of prison. Whereas in Norway, uh, not only are the prisons almost like you know, the club med types, uh, and they have lower recidivist rates as well, even for murders and rapists and, and whatnot. Uh, do, you, do you think that... Uh, uh, Is able to vote in Norway? Is this what you were going to say? Well, they, I, as far as I know, they don't have their franchise stripped from them, their, their ability to... Even when they're in prison? Because I know Florida has recently voted for a referendum to give 
prisoners who served their sentences back on the right to vote. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that's so, something I, I don't know. With people in Florida. Yeah, I mean, you've got different understanding of um, the relationship between the individual and the community in these um, countries. And I think it's a better model. But one thing that allows it to be a better model is that these countries are much more homogeneous. First of all, they're small. Yeah. Sweden, is, uh, if my understanding is correct, it's under 10 million people. Yeah. So the U.S. is, um, what's it, 33 times as big as Sweden. And again, we're much more uh, diverse. And one of the problems you're seeing in these countries through immigration is that as these countries become more diverse, people's willingness to support the welfare state, people's willingness to pay high taxes is going down. So these countries, as they become more diverse, are becoming politically more like the United States. So... Um, um, Diversity is, in many ways, good. It's desirable. Diversity also has the undesirable effect of making people feel less bound to the community. Yeah. People feel less bound to a diverse community than to a homogeneous community, whether it's right or wrong. I mean, this just seems to be a fact of social science. But let me, let me, let me just ask, though, George, just uh, as a social scientist perspective, uh, the U.S. is diverse, you know, and it's probably the most diverse country in the world, but it's often been segregated uh, through mo most, much of its history. And I know, for example, I live in Texas, as, as I mentioned, I live in a subdivision that when I was a boy in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, in, in the future, people of all colors will live together. Well, that's basically where I live. And the, the subdivision, which has maybe a thousand people where I live in, has very low crime rate. The people are very nice to each other. Even though this is Texas, it's hard to believe. Uh, it is sort of like those uh, films I would see in gym class or uh, an auditorium uh, in junior high. Uh, would it not be fairer to say that uh, it's not necessarily diversity that brings out the worst in people, but it, it, it's the segregation it, that I think when you actually live and two, two doors down, you have a black family, you have Mexicans across the street, and you have a Muslim family behind you. That is the thing. It's not enough to just have lots of different people, but you have to have them woven together like a fabric, not separated. Yeah, no, that sounds, I mean, that sounds good. I mean, I, I'll agree, diversity per se is not bad. Diversity when people huddle in their separate groups, and especially, as you just said, when they're not familiar with people in other groups, um, you get prejudice and you get hostility. So ideally, um, Governor Dinkins, I'm from New York, Governor Dinkins used to talk of New Mayor York Dinkins, as, Mayor Dinkins. Mayor, sorry. Mayor Dinkins used to talk of New York as, quote, a gorgeous mosaic. And this is the ideal. It sounds like your neighborhood is a gorgeous mosaic, which is something to aspire to. But again, um, um, you know, diversity still, you know, even though it, it can work out under certain circumstances, under other circumstances, which are probably more common, um, it does have these undesirable effects. So um, I, I think the remedy is more um, diversity. And I'm um, encouraging people to mix more. You know, again, supposedly the remedy for bad, for hate speech is more speech. Mm. So the remedy for diversity would be more diversity to help overcome people's prejudices. But one thing you learn from history is that people's prejudices are really difficult to overcome. Yeah. Uh, well, let me just uh, wrap this up uh, with a two-pronged uh, question. Number one, uh, what is the next... Uh, well, what is the focus of your studies, number one, uh, coming up in the next uh, few years uh, if you're writing a new book? And secondly, uh, what, uh, what aspect of social justice, at least, do you think has, uh, has been ignored or not studied enough that you would like to see brought more to the fore? So two-pronged there. Yeah, the second, you know, I think... Um the subject of equality among political philosophers is really studied um, enormously. Um, I think the subject, you know, really important subject is justice and health care. So I think that the public has to be educated about justice and health care and to overcome the prejudice, and I think it's a distinctively American prejudice, that health care is something that you are entitled to only if you're able to pay for it. Mm -hmm. 
So I think this is um, really um, important. And again, politically, it's gaining more attention. In the last election, the midterm election, the Democrats really ran on justice and health care. And I think this has caught on with the United States. My own work, you know, I do sort of technical political philosophy. The great work of um, Thomas Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn talks about what he calls normal science. And normal science is, um, he says it's puzzle solving, and it's puzzle solving to extend the paradigm. So th there's a basic um, model, a basic theory that you think is correct. And puzzle solving would be working on the edges of this theory in order to extend it, to make the theory more powerful, to make the theory apply to more subjects. So I work on political application. The question is why we should obey the law. And I've got a theory that I've worked on for the last um, 30, 35 years. So what I do is I uh, have spent the last 30, 35 years trying to bolster this theory, trying to extend it. And my work in the next couple of years is I'm going to move into legal philosophy and trying to talk about different aspects of the law and how they bear on this question of so this is what I work on, and this is what I'll be working on in the future. Let me just uh, follow up, because one thing came to mind. Um, uh, probably the greatest existential threat possibly to us, uh, hu the human race, although I don't think that we're going to go extinct even with global warming. I think technology oh. is that we're going to be able to get water from the sea, and we, there's a lot of things coming up that you can grow meat rather than killing animals. So I think there's a lot of social justice things such as animal rights that, that are beneficial. But um, do you think that an existential threat like uh, global warming is going to be, in a sense, uh, an odd boon towards uh, uh, social justice? Because there's the old saying that everyone's equal in a graveyard. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's great. Um, yeah, you mentioned, you know, I, I said justice and health care. I think you're probably right that um, another subject, equally important, perhaps more important, is environmental ethics. Yeah. And um, I had a student who did a dissertation on um, climate change. And in order to supervise the student, I had to read a lot of the literature on climate change, which is really, really, really depressing. Um, <laughs> and this was seen in the report of the President's Commission, which was dumped on Good Friday a couple of weeks ago. I mean, climate change, I don't know if it's an existential threat, but it's a huge threat. Um, agricultural disruptions, yeah. um, enormous um, areas of the earth are going to be underwater. Um, as climate changes, um, poor people especially are going to be affected adversely. And um, the consequences could be um, terrible. So it's not just hurricanes and fires. It's going to lead to a lot of um, political strife. So my student talked about political catastrophe. So the breakdown of political order um, in certain places seems to be a possible effect of climate change. And the consequences could be terrible, and terrible for really large numbers of people, um, not necessarily for people in wealthy countries in the Western world, so more for people in Africa, um, Southeast Asia, um, South America, maybe. But again, the consequences are going to be terrible unless people do something to put an end to this. And it doesn't look like um, the um, community of nations has the will to do what's necessary to put an end to this or to um, even to, to minimize the consequences um, as much as possible. Well, uh, I want to uh, thank you for speaking with me. I will link to uh, your University of Virginia page below here. Anyone who uh, has enjoyed this interview, can contact you there. So, George Klosko, uh, thank you for speaking to me for a second time. This time we got it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. All right.